Some men will be coming forward. If you do not have a Bible, they will be passing out Bibles, so get their attention, put your hand up, they'll put a Bible in your hand. And as we prepare for the Lord's Supper this morning, we will be looking at Matthew chapter 10. So if you would begin turning there in your Bibles, Matthew, Ch- Matthew 10. And we just sang the song Jerusalem, which reminded us of the realities of what we remember today in the church calendar of Palm Sunday, the day that the people of Israel appeared to receive their king only for several days later for the Jewish leaders and for the nation to follow them to call, cry out for his death. Um, and so today we'll be looking at Matthew 10 and do we receive the king? You can turn to Matthew 10, verse 28 and following. As we look at Matthew 10, earlier in the chapter, Jesus had appointed the 12 disciples and he gave them authority to cast out demons and heal diseases and sickness. And Matthew 10 records instructions that Jesus had given as he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of heaven to the lost people of Israel. And then in verses, as he describes this, It's apparent that some will receive their words, but many will reject their words. And then in verses 16 through 23, he speaks not only of rejection, but of persecution that they would experience that would extend beyond the upcoming mission into the land of Israel and to the ends of their lives. In verse 16, we read, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, But beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. Verse 22 speaks further of the reality of this persecution. And you will be hated by all because of my name, but it is the one who endures to the end who will be saved. The disciples, the apostles, would be hated because of their association with Christ and their proclamation of his words. We, in fact, Paul writes, this is true for all of us who are in Christ. Uh, Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3.12, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And we may not have experienced this type of persecution that the apostles experienced, uh, the type of persecution that our brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ in other parts of the world experience today. But we may soon. And Jesus' next words to his apostles, to, his, to the twelve, will be helpful to orient our own thinking as we prepare for the Lord's table this morning. So look down at verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. The disciples had every earthly reason to fear the men that they were about to go before. They even knew that some of them would be arrested, flogged, and put to death. But Jesus says, beware of them. But don't fear them. Don't fear those who can kill the body but are unable to kill the soul. Yes, men can harm the body, but men are not made of body alone. We have a soul. And Jesus says we should fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And believer, the sufferings that we might experience in this life might be fear-inducing, uh, that but they are temporary. God is the one with the authority to destroy both the body and the soul in hell. And we must fear him. We must fear sinning against him. Hell is not a place where Satan rules, but it is God himself who rules over hell. God is the one who has authority to judge. He is holy and his righteousness demands the just judgment of sin. And the object of the apostles' fear was to be God, not man. And what was the apostles' fear of God to look like? Look at verses 29 through 31. 
are not two sparrows sold for an asarion, a, a small copper coin, and yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered, so do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. And what a comfort to the apostles. Yes, a man might kill the body. We have no promise in this life that that won't occur. But just as not even a single sparrow worth less than the smallest copper coin would perish outside of God's sovereignty, so too would the lives of the disciples not perish without God's approval and plan. This wasn't a promise that the disciples wouldn't die, but their persecution, their mistreatment, even their death would be under the good, sovereign hands of the Father. Nothing was outside of his control. And the fear we are to have in God is a fear of his holiness and his judgment of sin, but also an absolute trust and a rest in his good and sovereign purposes, his sovereignty over life and death and even hell itself. And this provides the basis for what he says next in verses 32 to 33. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I also will confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny him before my Father who is in heaven. What does a right fear of God and trust in his sovereignty look like when we are before hostile men, governors, kings, those who hold our lives in their hands, who can kill our bodies. It is to remember that our lives are actually not in their hands. We are made of body and soul and man cannot touch our soul. Our lives are actually in God's hands, God's goodness, God's sovereignty. We trust him. We trust Christ. Notice how Jesus directs us to fear God, to fear the Father. Notice how we are to do that. Confession of Jesus before men, who is God. This is not just a verbal confession, but it is a statement of faith and trust in the face of death that our life extends beyond this world and our only hope is in Jesus. It is a willing entrustment of our very souls to him. And that type of of trust and faith would give the apostles and will give us confidence in the face of persecution and suffering in this world when we stand before others who may have our lives in what would appear to be their hands. Our hands, our lives, or our lives are in the hands of a good and a holy God who alone can destroy the soul. God is the one who judges sin. And yet we confess Jesus. And because of him, we will not experience the eternal destruction of our souls and our bodies in hell. Because Jesus, God's son, took upon him the Father's wrath in the place of all who would put their trust in him. But there is another reality that's on display here. God does indeed judge the body and the soul. Yes, the earthly body will come to an end in this world, but a time is coming when we will all receive new eternal bodies. And in those eternal bodies, God will judge with ongoing eternal destruction, both the body and soul of all who reject him, who do not trust in him, who do not receive him. But those who believe our eternal bodies and our eternal souls have salvation. And all of us with eternal bodies are headed for an eternal destiny. And what determines which eternal reality we will face and experience is how we respond to God's son, Jesus. If you have not trusted in Christ alone for salvation, do so today. Don't leave without talking to someone about what it means to confess Christ, to put your hope in him, to rest in his hands. After the service, if you do not know Christ, someone 
to my right, to your left, will be at these doors. And they would love to talk to you about what it means to put your hope and trust in Christ. For those who do confess Christ, as you receive the bread and the cup, remember and rejoice in Christ's death on your behalf. And then rejoice in what he has accomplished and in the great rescue that we have in him. And then in a few minutes, I will come back up and I'll pray for us. Men, please come forward and serve us.